students, welcome back. This is Tora's Elbow Bump. How are you? Are you doing okay? Is your family okay? Remember, if you need anything, send me an email so that I can try to help in some way or another, or I can get you in touch with somebody that can help. So lucky you, you get to hear my voice for another lecture, but the best part is, is we're gonna continue learning about probabilities under the curve, and this time we're gonna start working on putting everything together. So I wanna start off by letting you know that there is still a new technology offer. Uh, Pearson has made their books and software available for free this semester. They have a really great program called StatCrunch. I'm gonna start using it today so that you can see how easy it is to use. And if you go into Blackboard, um, you'll see that I have a document in there that tells you how to sign up for StatCrunch. And if you have any questions, email me. Uh, worst case scenario, I'll just send you out an email giving you step-by-step -step instructions on how to sign up for StatCrunch. You'll find that it's really, really easy to use. You just need to know kind of like what buttons to press, and it does a lot of the work for you. It does a lot of the probability calculations for you. So it, makes, it puts a little bit of the pressure off of you to be able to know exactly what part of um, the different probability calculators to find. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's really easy. I really like it. Um, so I'm going to show you how that works today. I want to just really quickly, without spending too much time on this, because, you know, I keep saying it over and over, pro tip if a professor says something over and over and over again, that means that it's really, really important to them. And when something is really, really important to your professor, that means that you're probably going to see it on something that counts a lot towards your grade, like either some sort of project or a test. So this is really important to me. So heads up, you're gonna see this throughout the semester and probably on something that's going to affect your final mark. So in order to apply the proportions of the empirical rule, 68, 95, 99, approximations again, the distribution of the data must be normal. So most of the data is going to be found within one standard deviation before and after the mean. So 68% of that 100% is gonna be within one standard deviation before and after the mean. As we move out, we're gonna know that um, about 95% of the data is going to be within two standard deviations before and after the mean. As we get farther out, three standard deviations is going to incorporate approximately 99% of all the data, okay? And then as we start to get out even further, then we start to use up more of that 100%. Okay. Um, now, in order for this to happen, the distribution of the data must be normal. Okay, so that means that we have to have um, certain, you know, it has to have a certain shape, a certain distribution for any of this to matter. If that cannot be checked, if it cannot be assumed, then none of this will work. Okay, so that brings me to the next bullet. Normality can be assumed if there's numerical and visual evidence that the distribution is within an acceptable range. No data is going to be perfect. No real data is going to be perfect. You're going to get some that's really, really good, but it's never going to be perfectly, perfectly normal. It has to be normal enough. You're going to check for normality numerically, and you can do this three different ways that we've learned so far. One is to compare the mean relative to the median, and they should be approximately the same and in the center of the mode. You're going to look at the skewness statistic, which should be between between negative one and positive one. If it extends past that range, you cannot assume normality. You're also going to look at the kurtosis statistic. The kurtosis statistic should be between positive three and negative three. If it extends beyond that range, you cannot assume normality. Another way that you can check normality is visually, and there's three types of graphs that we have worked with in my course to check the data visually. The first is the histogram. The histogram should be unimodal, so there should be just one mound. It should be symmetrical, meaning that the tails are approximately the equal length, okay? The next is the box plot. The median should be approximately in the center of the interquartile range. Another way to call that is the each spread, and the whiskers should be approximately the same length. The next thing is that you need to look at the QQ plot. The QQ plot plots the raw data against the theoretical raw scores on of a, that were created using um, like a line. Okay, so basically what happened is the computer took 
the mean and the standard deviations and plotted exactly what the Z score should be and the raw score should be if the data was perfectly normal. But it's not perfectly normal, okay? It's, it's a little bit off. So what we're gonna be doing is looking at how off is it. If the data, if the, if the data was perfectly normal, right, the raw data was perfectly normal, then it would fit exactly on that theoretical, theoretical raw score. Or I'm, yeah, the theoretical raw score line. The data is not going to be perfectly normal because it's raw random data. So you're going to get, a, if, it's, if it's good enough, right, if it's normal enough, you're gonna get a lot of those dots right on top of that theoretical line. And you're probably gonna get some dispersion or some scatter on the extreme lows and then the extreme highs where you're, you're probably gonna get the most amount of deviation. Once you can assume normality, then you can start applying the empirical rule, okay? You can calculate z-scores by just using the z-score formula. You can calculate raw scores, which is just using the raw score formula, which is really just rearranging the z-score formula. All you did was, you know, the z-score formula, let me get my pointer again. If you took this one right here, look, it looks like a comment. Um, and you decided to kind of rearrange it. So for example, you multiplied the z-score times the standard deviation, you would get x minus x bar equals z times the standard deviation. If you added x bar to both sides, then you would have x equals z standard times the standard deviation plus x bar would give you the raw score. So really all you're doing is just you're reworking this formula to get to this formula. It's the exact same th thing, they are equivalent. If you wanted to find um, the proportion or the area under the normal curve, what percentage of that shape is taken up, um, there's a couple ways to do it. If you need just rough approximations, you can use anchor z-scores of negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, to give a rough, rough approximation of what, you know, what is taken up what amount of the area has been sort of taken up of that. If you wanted to find more precise measurements, you need to use some sort of technology or you need to use these things called Z tables, which are just like these this big table of columns of numbers and you look up the row and the column and you find the number that you need within them. Z tables are a pain to use. I mean, you can use them, but they're a little, a little bit of a pain. It's always easier when you just have technology that can just punch this stuff in. If you want to take a look at the last video that was made, it was called Putting It All Together, Probabilities Under the Normal Curve. And it's the video immediately preceding this one. It gives you examples one and two. We're going to continue to use some of these written examples in today's lesson, examples three and four, and then we're gonna go ahead and start to do some that are gonna require us working with raw data all the way to the question, answering it with technology. So doing everything together, checking for normality, everything together. So let's start with some review. So this is example three. The question says, the average number of acres burned by forest and range fires in large New Mexico County is 4,300 acres per year with a standard deviation of 750 acres. The distribution of the number of acres burned is normal. Okay, so it's telling you right away, it's not giving you the raw data. I haven't given you a spreadsheet with a bunch of raw data. It's going ahead and giving you a summary of the situation now. Then it says, what is the probability that between 2,500 and 4,200 acres will be burned in any given year? What number of the burn it <laughs> acres should be burned? I'll go ahead and check, uh, fix that. Burned acres corresponds to the 38th percentile. Okay. All right. So again, Zeitboard is pasted down below in case you need it. Okay. So... Remember, my pro tip was draw this thing out. So let's draw this thing out. I'm gonna go ahead and use my black pencil to draw, draw out an approximation. Let's see how my drawing works today. One, oops, two. Still not the best, but you know, it'll be fine. 
here are my z-scores. My mean is 4,300. Standard deviation is 750. I'm going to go ahead and write this out here in case I need it. So I've got my calculator. I'm going to go ahead and figure out what's going on here. This would be a great time for you to pause the video and see if you can actually calculate the corresponding raw scores for the anchor Z scores. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I just automatically start adding first. So 4,300 plus 750 equals 750 plus 750 And I'm going to take it in the opposite direction. Clear. 4,300 minus 750. 3,550. Minus 750, 2800, Okay, so I've got my anchor Z scores here. I can start to get an idea of what's happening. Okay, so it says, the first one says, what is the probability that between 2,500 acres and 4,200 acres will be burned in any given year? So let's see what that means. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use this purple color again. You know, nobody commented down below to tell me if this was purple or pink. So you need to do that today. Okay, here is about approximately 2,500 is going to be somewhere in between 2,050 and 2,800. So I'm going to say that this is approximately 2,500 and 4,200 is going to be somewhere in here. I want to know what percent of this curve can be described in this colored, in this colored piece, on this little colored piece right here. Okay, so what I need to be able to do is use technology. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and figure out what my z-scores are. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out what my z-score, this is 4200 right here, I'm going to write that down here, 4200, and this is 2500. I want to know what my z-scores are for that. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out my z-score for 4200 first. And here's my z-score formula. Z equals x minus x bar deviations from the mean. Deviation, mean. deviation means like how far away. So this top part right here is the deviations from the mean. How far away is your raw score x from the mean x bar? And divided that, divide that by standard deviation. Okay, so um, my raw score for 4200 is 4200. And my mean here was 4,300. And my standard deviation is 750. Let's see if I can straighten this out because it's kind of leaning, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to go up here. 4,200 minus 4,300 is negative 100. And if I divide that by 750, 
I'm going to get, here's my z-score, 4,200. I'm going to get, let's clear this out again. So 100, negative 100, divided by 750 is going to be negative 0 0.133. which makes sense, it's a little bit negative, and that's where this is right here. It's just a little bit negative. Not a lot. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and find my um, z-score for this lower value. I'm gonna go ahead and put this lower value right here, 2500 in green. So my z-score for 2500 is going to be my raw score again, 2500, minus my mean, 4,300, divided by my standard deviation, 750. So I've got 2,500 minus 4,300. Clear, clear, clear. Say it with me. Clear, clear, clear. Clear, clear, clear. 2,500 minus 4,300 is negative 1,800. divided by 750, and I'm going to get negative 1800 divided by 750 equals negative 2.44. And let's look to see, oh, look, this makes sense. That's about negative 2.44. It's way down there. So negative 2.44, very good. Okay, so let's see if I can, um, use my original normal distribution calculator. You can get this off ePortfolio. And I'm gonna go ahead and click Enable Editing so that I can use it. And I'm going to put my two numbers in here. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller so I can see everything. I'm looking for the difference between those two numbers. My larger z-score is negative 0 0.133, negative 0 0.133 and my smaller z-score is the negative 2.44 and it says in between the large and small z-scores is 0.4397 another way to say that is 0.44 so I'm going to say that this area in between here I'm gonna go ahead and put that in um, blue. So this area in between here, in between these two, all this blue that I colored previously, if this whole shape was 100%, this part of the shape would be 0 0.4397, right? Or approximately 0 0.44, or 40, approximately 44% of the shape. So what is the probability that between 2,500 and 42 acres will be burned in any, every, any given year? The probability is 44%. Now it asks, what is the number of burned acres that corresponds to the 38th percentile? 38th percentile. So it wants to know, let's see, make this a little bit smaller, scooch this up. Um, like this just a little bit smaller and scooch this up. It wants to know what number of burned acres corresponds to the 38th percentile. So here is my same guy. And it wants to know what is the raw score, what is the number burn of burned acres corresponds to the 38th percentile. And to help us out, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my um,
little distribution here. Okay, and I want to know the bottom 38%. Bottom 38%. So this right here is 0.5, right? Another two is 2.5. 13.5 is 16. And then all, if we go to the center, that's 50%. So I want approximately 30%. What, what amount was that? That was 38th percentile. So 38th percentile. I'm going to go ahead and put this in or and let's try yellow. I wonder if you can see the yellow. Let me know. Comment down below. 38% percentile is going to be everything from here over. What what is what is that? And it wants to know that's not an x, that's a z. That's a Z, pardon me, <laughs> rhymed. Okay, X, it wants to know what is the raw score that's gonna match in through there. Now, if I have these numbers right here, 4,300, this number is going to be 3,550, it's gonna be a number in between those two. I know that. Okay, so then I can go back to my calculator. I need to know the lowest 38%. So here's my calculator, scooch this puppy over. I'm going to make this a little bit wider, and I need 38 percentile, so I need 0 0.38, and it's going to give me a z-score. It's going to say, if you have the lowest, lowest 38th percentile, gives you a z-score of negative 0.31. Okay, this is making sense. This number that corresponds here, that z-score that corresponds there is going to be approximately negative 0.31. Makes sense because it's between zero and negative one. Now I need to know what is the x? I have the, I have the z, what is the x for that? So I can go here to my little computer and I can say, okay, the mean is 4,300, the standard deviation is 750, the z-score is negative 0.31, so my x is 4,067 and a half acres. 4,067.5 acres, or approximately 4,068 acres. Okay, let's try a question four. The Edwards Theater chain has studied its movie customers to determine how much money they spend on concessions. The study revealed that the spending distribution is approximately normally distributed with a mean of $4.11 and a standard deviation of $1.37. What percentage of the customers will spend less than $3 on concessions? What, what spending amount corresponds to the 87th percentile, the top? 87th percentile. So let me go ahead and do as I've been doing. I'm going to go ahead and um, exit out of this. I'm going to go ahead and take all this information, copy paste it into our Zite board, move it down a little bit. Okay, and yep, there we go. Okay, so here's our information again. If I did a poor job of reading it previously, I will do my best to make it a little bit better now. Okay, so let's first start to look at what this kind of looks like relative to the shape of the bell curve. So here I'm gonna go ahead and draw my normal distribution. You know, I gotta say, doesn't it look easy when I do this? But <laughs> it's gonna be harder if you don't do it for your own self. So really taking the time here to pause the video and figuring this out for yourself, I'm is I can't I just can't recommend it enough. So I'm gonna tell you um, that 
this would be a great time for you to pause the video um, and figure out how you're going to set up the standard, the, the normal curve, your photo. Okay, and hopefully I'll meet you on the flip side. So I know that the mean is $4.11. I'm not gonna put the dollar sign because it's just more stuff. And this standard deviation is gonna be $1.37. I'm gonna go ahead and go into my calculator here and clear it all out. Clear, 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 clear. I'm gonna go ahead and add first $4.11 plus $1.37 is going to be $5.48. Oops. Five dollars and forty-eight cents plus one dollar and thirty-seven cents is six dollars and eighty-five cents. If I add an additional one dollar and thirty-seven cents, it's going to be eight dollars and twenty-two cents. Going in the opposite direction, I can take $4.11 and subtract $1.37 and I get $2.74. Going ahead and subtracting another $1.37, I get $1.37, which is just like wow and if I subtracted another dollar and 37 cents I'm gonna get nothing okay so this is how it's sort of falling out now the first question says what percentage of customers will spend less than three dollars on concessions so let's see where three dollars lies and what color have I not used it have I used this light blue color let's try this light blue color color I guess it's a cyan or turquoise I don't know comment down below Okay, $3 is right in through here, right? It's more than $2.74 and a lot less than $4.11. So $3 is approximately here. And it wants to know what percentage of customers will spend less than $3 on concessions. So it wants to know what amount of the curve is over here. Okay. And I'm going to, and one thing I didn't do on the last one is sort of write this out mathematically. So it wants to know what proportion of X is less than $3. So it wants to know that. Okay. So in order to find that, I really need to know what my Z score is there. So let's go ahead and use our Z score formula. Z score. Um, is going to be x minus x bar divided by standard deviation. If I want to find the z-score for three dollars, then I've got to use the three dollars minus the mean, which is 4.11, divided by the standard deviation, which is 1.37. Now, one thing that was probably poor form for me to do is it's always, besides just looking at this, it's always a good idea to write, write it out on the side for yourself too. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this over here. The mean was $4.11 and the standard deviation was $1.37, okay? So now let's look to see if we set this up, okay? This z-score is got to be between 0 and negative 1 and if I take 3 take away $4.11 I'm going to end up with a negative number so let's go to my z-score calculator my just regular calculator and I'm going to go ahead and put this information in so I've got $3 minus $4.11, I get negative $1.11 and if I take that and I divide it by one point three seven I'm going to get negative 0 0.81 so I'm gonna go ahead and just scooch this over here and I'm gonna put this is 
the z-score for three dollars is going to be negative 0 0.8102 which makes sense this that makes sense this z-score is probably going to be negative 0 0.8102 now I need technology to figure out what this area to the left of the z-score is going to be let me ask you this does it make sense why it's to the left think about it we're looking for what amount what percentage of customers will spend less than three dollars so any, if you were looking at a number line every anything less than three dollars is going to be to the left of three dollars so let's look to see what our z-score calculator tells us so here i am back to my handy dandy z-score calculator probability calculator thing app that I use I'm gonna go ahead and use this part I've got a z-score and I want to know my z-score is negative make sure I put the negative in because if you put the positive in it's gonna be a little bit further to the right so negative 0 0.8102 enter it's at, it's gonna tell me two numbers the area to the left and the area to the right we want the area to the left so the area to the left is 0 0.2089 so this area right here, that area right there, corresponds with 0 0.2089. If the whole curve was a whole, it would only take 0 0.2089 of it, which if you're looking at, um, if you're gonna round it, it would come out to 0 0.21, and that would be approximately 21% of the curve. So what percentage of their customers spend less than $3? 21% spend less than $3. And if you wanted to write that as a decimal, you would just write it as 0 0.21. That's the same, okay? Now it says, what amount of spending corresponds to the top 87th percentile? Okay, the top 87th percentile. So let's round this. Let me go ahead and make this a little bit smaller again. And this time I'm going to, um, I want to know um, the top 87th percentile. I'm going to go ahead and really quickly draw my curve again. I know that I know you're getting sick of watching me draw this. I don't know how because I mean look how fascinating this is. Zero, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three, Here's my z-scores. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drag this normal curve over here so that you have it to kind of compare. And here it is. Okay. If I, whoops, if I wanted to look at the top 87%, well, remember everything from here over, I'm going to put this in red, everything from here over right here would be 50%, right? Because it's half of the curve. Now I want 87%. This additional part is going to be 84%. So if I wanted to look at 87%, 87% would be right about uh, pink, right about here. Very, very close. That would be, that would be sort of the mark for 87%. Very, very just slightly past positive one z-score okay so what spending amount what x is going to correspond with that z-score that is just so slightly there okay and it's basically asking what is the boundary what raw score would be the boundary be between the lower 87 and the top 13 percent I'm going to go back to this and I want to know the top 87% is going to have a z-score. It's going to have a positive z-score, right? Because it's going to be in through here. The top 87%, it's going to give me a z-score of approximately 
1.13. Perfect. Positive z-score right in between 1 and 2. That makes sense. Now I can go down to right down here where it says, what is the mean? Well, my mean was $4.11. My standard deviation was $1.37. The z-score that I'm concerned about is 1.126, right? And it says that the top 87% or the number, the raw score that separates the bottom 87% with the top 13% would be $5.65. Example five is gonna give us an opportunity to go from raw data all the way through to using uh, technology to answer the questions. So example five says, if a CUNY student completes their first semester courses successfully, they will earn 15 credits by the end of the semester. CUNY would like to study how quickly their students earn credits during their first semester in college using randomly selected sample of students. And it gives you a link to the sample data. You'll also find the sample data down below in a Google Sheet. The first question is, what percentage of students will earn at least 12 units at the end of the first semester? What number of units correspond to the top 75th percentile? All right, let's do this. All right, so let me go ahead and exit out of this. I'm going to go ahead and take all this information, copy, put it on Zightboard, and I'm going to go ahead and scrooch this up. I'm going to go ahead and put it in black and put this here. <coughs> and this time I'm going to go ahead and use StatCrunch. So StatCrunch um, as I said, it's a really great program that will give you um, information about how to use uh, it just it's one place where it just kind of fixes everything for you. So I'm going to go ahead and um, open StatCrunch and I'm going to go ahead and take the fictional data that I have on my Google Sheet on my Google spreadsheet. Um, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to go ahead and just open this fictional earned data. It's going to open in a Google spreadsheet. Uh, open with Google Sheets. And I'm going to go ahead and just select the whole column and copy it. And then go into StatCrunch. And notice, notice very carefully where I'm going to actually um, paste this. I'm going to click where it says VAR1 so that that very first column can have the title, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and name this fictional, uh, fictional earned credit scores example five, okay? <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and save it. All right, so here I have raw data. First things first. Before I can apply anything, I have to make sure if this data is actually normal because the question did not tell us that this was normally distributed. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to stat where it says summary stats. I'm gonna tell it to work with the columns. I'm gonna click earn credits. And then I'm gonna go ahead <clears throat> and select what I want. I wanna go ahead and take the count. I wanna see how many are there. Holding the control key or the command key if you have a Mac, I'm going to go ahead and select mean, standard deviation, median. Mm, I like to get all the stuff that goes with the box whisker. So, um, you know, the whole interquartile stuff, interquartile range. Of course, the skewness and kurtosis and the mode. And I'm going to go ahead <clears throat> and hit compute. All right, so let's look at numerically, see what we've got here. Okay, I've got, a, I've got 478 randomly selected students. The mean is 10.95 and the median is 12. More or less about the same. Um, the mode is 10.5, so they're all around the same number. Awesome. Skewness is negative 0.53, meaning that it's slightly negatively skewed or, or skewed to the left. 
the skewness is within the appropriate range, which is positive and negative one, so skewness looks good. Kurtosis is negative 0 0.29, meaning that it's slightly negatively kurtotic or platykurtotic. It's within the range of positive and negative three, so that's also okay to, to go, and we're good. Numerically, this is looking fine. Okay, so next thing, histogram. Let's see what this looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and click Earn Credits. What's really nice about StatCrunch is you can do an overlay. So I'm gonna do the normal overlay. I like to select the mean and the median. The mean is green, it rhymes, that's how I always remember it. Compute, and let's see what this looks like. All right, here's my normal distribution. Tails are approximately equal length. Um, the mean and the median are about the middle. This is looking good too. I'm um, starting to lose my voice here. Uh, let's see, next thing I wanna do is look at the box plot, earned credits. I'm gonna go ahead and mark the mean and the median. A lot of you have told, you, told me that you like to look at the boxes horizontally. So I'm going to head and moving it horizontally, compute. This is looking really good. The median is red. The median is in the center of the interquartile range or the X. Remember the box is the interquartile range and we want the median to be approximately in the center. The left tail is slightly longer than the right tail, which corresponds with the negative skewness that we saw in the, um, in the numerical stats. And we do kind of see a little bit more stuff over here. So that's also corresponding so far so good. All right. Let's look at the QQ plot. Go to graph, QQ plot, earn credits, compute. This is a little bit different. Now I want you to notice what's happening here. See how these kind of look like steps? This happens when you have discrete data. So when you, discrete data remember is there's definitely intervals that ex that exist between two numbers they're not continuous so if you if we looked at the data right here you know there's like 12 a bunch of 12s there's a bunch of 13.5s there's a bunch of 15s okay there's not like 10.25 so there's not there's definitely breaks where there are no numbers that's when it starts to include sort of like the stepwise type of look it starts to look like steps but just because it's discrete data doesn't mean that it doesn't it doesn't um, apply to the premise of the QQ plot. These should still pretty much hug the theoretical line. So if you look at these, a lot of them are touching the theoretical line. Here at the ends, we start to get a little bit of disbursement. It starts to kind of like spray out. And here at the top, it kind of starts to spray out. So that's still this is still looking like it's it's pretty good, okay? We're getting a lot of spray out here. We're, we're in the negative three, negative two. It's starting to distribute, which is, again, something that we're seeing over here. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. We're seeing a lot of variance over here. It's starting to spray out. We're seeing a little bit of variance over here. It's starting to spray out, but not as much as over here. So, again, this is all indication that the data is normal. Since the data is normal, we can proceed. Okay, so we took care of step one. So since the data is normal, let's go to the site board and see, go ahead and start drawing this puppy out because we can assume normality. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this puppy out. I know you're going to get tired of me telling saying this. Now is a great time for you to pause the video and see if you can come up with the corresponding X values that are aligned to this. Okay, so it says, um, well, we need the mean and the median. Okay, so the mean and the median are gonna be here. The mean is 10.95. So mean. And the median. is 12. And then more than anything else, we need the standard deviation. Standard deviation is going to be 4.95. 
Okay, so let's start computing these raw scores. I'm going to go ahead and do it in red, bring up my calculator. Clear, 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 clear. Okay, so my mean is 10.95, 10.95. I'm going to add an additional 4.95 and get 15.9. So here I have 10.95 plus an additional 4.95 is going to give me 15.9. Uh, here's my mean. I'm getting kind of sloppy. I guess I want to be done. I bet you want me to be done, but it's not going to happen. Okay, so there's that. I'm going to bring over my calculator again and add another 4.95. And I'm going to get 20.85. And I'm going to add another 4.85. 9.5. I'm going to get 25.8. Clear. 10.95 minus 4.95 and I'm going to get 6. Six minus four point nine five. I'm gonna get a dollar or one five, one oh five. And then the last one. Oops, the last one is gonna be. That's a huge calculator. The last one um, is going to be um, nonsensical because you can't have negative units. Like you can't come into college owing units, so it's nonsensical, but it's going to be negative 3.9. Okay. Okay, so it says, what percentage of students will earn at least 12 units by the end of their first semester? So 12 units is going to be approximately here. Go ahead and put this in green, Christmas colors. 12 units is going to be right about here. Okay, and we want to know what happens with 12 units. We want to know how many students earned at least 12. Now, sometimes students can get confused, and even I do, when it's like at least, what do they mean by at least? Well, let's, let's look at this in terms of a number line. If you earned 10.95, did you earn at least 12 units? No, you did not earn at least 12 units. But if you earned 15.9, did you earn at least 12 units? Yes. So what we want is everybody over here. All these people earned at least 12 units and these people did not. Taking the time to make sense of the problem, even if you have to go back and say, okay, I'm at 12. If I go to the left, does that make sense? If somebody earned six units, did they learn at, earn at least 12 units? No, that doesn't make sense. Let me look to the right. If somebody earned 20 units, did they learn earn at least 12? Yes. So it has to be everybody to the right. Sometimes when you say at least Right? You automatically assume it's stuff to the left. So don't confuse the word least and less. You have to make sense in terms of the context of the problem. Okay, going back and making sense. Again, I can show you all these tips and tricks, but it's not going to be as meaningful as when you develop these ideas for yourself. I can just kind of give you my pro tips. But when you find your own dynamic and your own way to think through these things, the better off you'll be. Okay, so 
what percentage of these st students earned at least 12 units? So let's go to StatCrunch. And I'm going to go ahead and um, go to where it has calculators and it has normal calculators. Okay, and here is my information. Now it has standard in between. I want to know not in between two numbers, but either to the left or to the right, and we decided that we wanted to the right. So I'm going to put in the mean. Here is the mean that we calculated. So I'm gonna put in 10.951883. Let's be as precise as possible. Remember when we were more precise, we minimize error and we can have more certainty in the validity of our results. The standard deviation is gonna be 4.949. 4072. Okay? And I want to know what proportion of students got greater than 12. Look at my picture. This diagram is very similar to the one that I drew in Zeitboard. So this says the probability of a student scoring above 12 units is going to be 0. 416. So I'm going to go here and write this out. The probability of a person getting more or equal to 12 units is going to be 0 0.4. Do you remember what number it was? I'm going to click over here. 16. 16. If I were going to write this as a, per as a percentage, I would say the probability of somebody scoring, or I'm sorry, earning more than 12 units would be 41.6%. Pretty good, pretty good, right? Lots of students, about, you know, a little bit less than 50% chance of um, earning at least 12 units in your first uh, semester of college. Looks great. The next part of the question asks, what number of units corresponds to the top 75th percentile? So if we're gonna look at our picture here, remember that half of the curve is 50%. Another standard deviation would bring us up to 84%. And I will scooch the, our normal curve that we've been using for uh, reference right here, okay? Half of this, Half of this would be 50%, right? This is 50%. Another standard deviation would bring us up to 84%, and we don't want 84%, we want 75%. So we're looking at something that's approximately right about here, 75%, okay? So we wanna know what amount, what raw score is gonna match up with that 75%. So let's go to StatCrunch again. And let me give you a huge pro tip. Every time you do something new in StatCrunch, go ahead and open up a new calculator. I have found that it can sometimes keep old information in there and it won't, it doesn't really help you. So go into calculators. You're gonna go ahead and op open normal. I'm gonna go ahead and type in the mean information from the summary stats, so 10.95, 1883 standard deviation is going to be 4.9494072. Okay, I, I get this right here from the summary stats. And I want to know what is the raw score? What is the raw score so that I know the 75%? I'm sorry. Yeah, what is the raw score when I want to know the, the uh, 75 percentile? So I'm gonna put in 0.75, that's the 75th percentile. I'm writing the percentage as a decimal, hit, com hit compute. It tells me that the raw score is 14.29. That shows the 75th percentile, okay? So the raw score that separates, the raw score that separates the bottom 75% from the top 25% is 14.29. That raw score 
is 14.29. So that's it for today. Again, today's big idea is make sure the curve is normal before you start to apply the principles of the probability. And with that said, don't forget to check your emails, check Blackboard, do your homework, and subscribe to this channel. Even better, hit that notification bell so you know when there are new videos for this course. Okay? Okay, so this is your teacher Torres saying stay safe, and I will be waiting to give you a virtual elbow bump in the next video. Ciao!